to thank the organizing committee for, uh, for giving me this opportunity to conduct the course on Rock Hard Cataracts Easy Way. So these are the faculty. We have already heard Dr. Haripriya, and um, Dr. Hamon Rajan is also a prolific surgeon, and um, he has presented in several national and international conferences and is authority on uh, cataracts, and particularly heart cataracts. And we have with us Dr. Nivian, who will be joining us. Um, he's young blood, has a lot of experience, and is an innovator as well, and he'll be speaking on management of subluxated heart cataracts. So my topic is on small pupil and heart cataract. And nowadays we see that post cohort scenario, I think almost all of us are seeing quite a lot of heart cataracts, what we never used to see before. The initially when we started FACO, we used to see a lot of heart cataracts, but now the heart cataracts was only about 10% of our practice. Now it's a reversal. We see quite a lot of heart cataracts and this is a very common scenario now. Pupils not dilated, very small pupils, very heart cataracts has become a very common scenario post COVID. So well, the causes for uh, um, small pupils are long-term use of myotics, pseudo-exfoliation, prior iritis with cyanicate, trauma, diabetes, or it could be just poor uh, uh, mediatic application. It's associated with advanced stage, advanced nucleus sclerosis. And there's a specific condition called intraoperative floppy iris syndrome, where there's a triad of intraoperative signs with iris billowing and floppiness, iris prolapse, and progressive meiosis of pupil. This happens to the lack of tone of the dilatator muscles of the iris. So the preoperative management would be to stop myotics, uh, use uh, long-acting midriatics, and give a peribulbar subtenons block in this patient because you are anticipating some problems. So intraoperative uh, floppy iris use high density viscoelastic, but even then it's always better to anticipate this problem and probably be ready to have a pupil expanding device like iris hooks. Use low foam. If you're in the middle of surgery, you can use low foam parameters in vacuum and aspiration. So this is a challenging situation. You can see the, uh, um, the cataract that I'm um, uh, operating now. You can see that I'm removing all the cyanicate. This I did about 10, 15 years back and before even the iris uh, hooks came and you can see I'm stretching the iris. This was one technique that we used to uh, handle very small cataracts. And after stretching, we get about a mid-dilated pupil. The other one is a UVIT cataract with the posterior sanicae in the pupillary margin. Again, these cataracts are um, quite difficult to handle and they can be handled in different ways. Nowadays, we have excellent pupil expanders, so we don't have to go in for uh, um, the stretching the iris because that can cause the iris to become loose and floppy and can actually present itself in the uh, phaco probe. So this is a fibrous pupillary membrane which we're using actually a vitrectomy uh, um, uh, scissors to cut the pupillary membrane. So the management would be a pupil stretching using iris hooks, pupil expansion rings. You can use intracameral adrenaline in patients who have not been dilated and using high density uh, viscoelastics. And this is a case of a very hard cataract with a pseudo exfoliation, non-dilating pupil. And uh, so desire to go ahead and do it, um, uh, use iris hooks. For me, the, the most important thing is that I prefer iris hooks in most all my cases. I do use other um, uh, uh, pupil expansion methods occasionally. So um, we have made four reports. There are people who use five uh, iris hooks also. But uh, four is actually quite sufficient. Less than that may be difficult to operate. So now with the four uh, iris hooks inserted, you've got a nice uh, large square pupil. Now you can make a side port and inject a very high density viscoelastic because you, don't, you want to stain this uh, capsule. It's very important that you stain this capsule. So if you use um, a HPMC, you cannot stain the capsule. So I've used a high density viscoelastic and I'm staining uh, the capsule using Tripan Blue and then going ahead with the rexes. In these cases, like Dr. Haripriya previously said, make a slightly larger rexes than you would normally do because you don't want any stress on the uh, zonules. Because already patients with pseudo exfoliation do have a chance of zonular dialysis. So making a larger rexes will uh, give you more space to operate and less stress on the zonules. And so um, and you can do a, a multiple quadrant hydro dissection, do a central trench like she also uh, suggested, and then you um, start chopping. My technique is a vertical chop. This is what I do in almost all the cases. So you've got a nice hold and then you chop. You can see that the chop doesn't go through. So you have to keep on doing the lateral separation till you get to see the uh, bottom. So here you can see that I'm chopping. So you do a little bit more lateral separation, go all round. 
till you separate the central hard nucleus code. Once you've separated the central hard nucleus, and till the time you just go around and make multiple chops. Don't chop once and remove because you need that resistance for chopping. And once you've got the central core out, now you can go ahead and do a more of a lateral separation till you remove all the uh, pieces. So this can be done either, see you can see that here that I'm using the FACO Pro, but it's always in the pupillary plane not in the anterior chamber. So that is also important. Uh, avoid keeping your, uh, there's a tendency for us to go to the, do an anterior chamber phaco because that's going to cause more endothelial loss. And throughout the surgery, if you notice that the, uh, the anterior chamber is very stable and the phaco dynamics are working very well. And with this, now you've removed all the cortex, the lens can be inserted. And once the lens is inserted, you can remove the iris hooks and watch the, um, uh, remove all the viscoelastic. Don't remove the iris hooks before because then you will not be able to see the margin of the rexus and you may be putting the lens outside the, um, outside the uh, margin of the rexus. So remove, after you put the uh, lens, you remove all the iris hooks and now you can wash thoroughly. Usually there can be a little bit of a stretching of the pupil post um, using an iris hook but um, uh, post-operatively, they do constrict to normal size. So the caveats are use high phaco power. That's very important. You should not push the nucleus because already these patients who have pseudo exfoliation have very poor zonules, are prone for um, zone dialysis. So minimal manipulation in the back, high density viscoelastic. You can use, so my go-to is also visco, like Dr. Hari Priya mentioned, I have no financial interest. Viscoat is a combination of good dispersive with uh, cohesive uh, viscoelastic. It's more dispersive actually, so it protects endothelium, but it also gives quite sp good space. And then you use in patients who are not dilated, you can use an iris hook or you can use an adrenaline. And always keep a CTR handy if you come across these patients. So this is another case which I'm going to show you just to show that you can do these cases without any um, uh, pupil expanding devices if you use the correct parameters. This patient has a hard cataract and also a white cataract. So there's not going to be any uh, fundal glow. That's uh, uh, again, uh, something against us. That's why you have to do st staining of the capsule. And once you've stained the capsule, you do multiple quadrant hydro dissection. Don't over hydrate the bag because already the nucleus is filling the bag. So multiple quadrants, you do hydro dissection and gently rotate and see whether uh, the nucleus is rotating. Otherwise, you can do a little bit of trench, and then again, you can come out and do a hydro dissection. Don't overhydrate. So here, I'm again creating a central trench. I'm going, I'm using a very large uh, sharp chopper, and the sharp chopper helps because it helps us to cleave the nucleus. And once you've done, you see, you can do a, a multiple quadrant chopping. You don't have to, immediately separate like what I'm doing now. You can do multiple quadrant chopping. You remove the central nucleus core. You, you, once you do start doing chopping, you can see that the central nucleus core starts separating and you'll be able to access it better. Once you've done that, you can go ahead and remove the central nucleus core and then again continue to ch chop till you reach the margin. Once, see the other important thing here in this aspect, what I'd say is, at this point, if you switch on the retro elimination in your microscope, you get a very nice red glow. So that allows you to understand the depth to which way you're operating. So here, this is one of my very old videos, I've not done that. But nowadays, my, the most important thing I do is, beyond this stage, you switch on the retro elimination. So that gives you a very nice glow, so you, will, you know your PC is protected, you know there is no PCR, your uh, reflex is very good, and it also helps you to know where exactly your excess margin is. Because sometimes, even if you stain, sometimes these stains do fade away, and it gives you a, a more control over the surgery. See, throughout, what I want to emphasize in this case, you see that the pupil size has not gone down, in spite of doing you know, quite extensive chopping, and that is a trick because you can do, you can operate on any size pupil, provided you understand the phaco dynamics. Do not touch the pupils at all. Do not over inflate. And also not, don't make too much of fluctuations in the anterior chamber. That's, that is one cause for the pupil to go down. Otherwise the pupil, pupil can remain like this. 
The other reason, of course, is what you cannot avoid is in uh, AFI as it is uh, floppy iris syndrome, where uh, even in the middle of surgery, sometimes you have to convert and uh, use a, um, a high risk hook or some pupil expanders. So the next case I'm going to show you is a malugid ring. Malugid ring is made of polypropylene. It has four scrolls, something like the uh, tip of a safety pin, and it uh, engages the pupillary margins very um, uh, atraumatically. It can be, it is introduced, uh, it's preloaded and can be introduced to the main port. See here I'm giving some good viscoelastic. This is the preloaded uh, malugan ring. You can see the scrolls. These scrolls catch on to the iris uh, margin. And there are four scrolls. You can just inject them and then you can even place them uh, after the injection. You don't have to do it in, in one go. So you just gently make sure the scrolls act like a paper clip. So they just clip on to the iris. And once you've injected completely, you will get a nice round pupil. So you don't get a square pupil, but you'll get a nice round pupil. So this uh, iris is a little bit more rigid. So you can see we need to take a little bit more extra pressure for stretching it. Now you have a, a nice large round pupil. Once you have a large round pupil, there is no problem at all. It's just, just go ahead with a regular surgery. You can do whatever surgery technique that you're used to in case of heart cataracts and the procedure will be completed. So the, the main issue here is the pupil. So that is what I'm stressing on. So this is one way of handling it. So malugan rings is widely used. The only downside to it is that it's a little bit expensive and it cannot be reused. So um, it can probably you can uh, use it on uh, patients who can afford it. Uh, but uh, iris hooks are not so expensive. There, there are uh, versions where you can sterilize them and reuse it. And um, so uh, that works out better in most cases. But this is one excellent technique and which is very atraumatic to the pupil and does not produce any change in the pupil size throughout the surgery. And then once you go ahead, it doesn't cause any change in the phacodynamics as well. And once you've done this and implanted the lens, it can be very easily removed through the same port uh, using the same instrument which is something like a small clip and you can just uh, dismantle this paper clips um, from the uh, iris and using the same instrument which for which was uh, used for injecting it you can see there's a small clip and you can just take it inside and remove it so coming to the next surgery this is one of the uh, indian innovations it's called as bx and it's a bx pupil expander is uh, very similar it's called as hex because it's got hexagonal shape and Patan Charji is the one who did it. So I just want to show you the different, uh, the, the different, you can see how it looks. So it has got an, a broad portion as well as multiple tabs. And see, see this has got a, a, a broad portion and then it has got multiple tabs for holding the iris and flexible notches. So the, actually the iris goes into these flexible notches and the tabs come on top, this goes underneath. So basically it creates a hexagonal shape a pupil and it is uh, extremely thin. It's made of very extremely thin material. It's only 0.075 millimeters. And it's, you can see it's flexible. It can be introduced through a side port very nicely. And it can be either uh, used uh, using a manipulator or uh, using something like the, uh, introducing forceps you can use. It's always better to inflate uh, under the iris a little bit and you can see there's a platform to hold the uh, BHEX and then which is introduced. And once it goes inside, you can tuck in the, uh, the flanges one by one very easily because it's extremely uh, user friendly and you get a, a hexagonal size uh, pupil of approximately about 6 to 6.5 millimeters as you can see here and that is good enough to uh, go ahead with our cataract surgery without the uh, pupil uh, uh, coming uh, into the phaco port. So then once it is done, um, once, the, once the procedure is done, you can disengage this, uh, these uh, pupil expander and it can be removed very easily through the either through the side port or through the main port. And you can see how nicely the pupil has become round. And again, it's very atraumatic because it's extremely thin and very user friendly. So this is a complicated cataract which I showed you earlier. And I'm just going to repeat this uh, surgery. Only thing I'm going to complete the surgery, I just showed you how, the, um, how it's been expanded. So 
So this is, um, I'm using a second instrument rod to release all the posterior sinicae. And even now you can stretch, suppose you've come across a situation where you have not uh, having any pupil expanders, you can stretch, but make sure you don't stretch in the direction of the main uh, wound, because that's an area where the iris becomes very weak. And when you're doing the FACO, make sure that even if you go close to the iris, your port is pointing down and not towards the iris because then the iris is already floppy, it's going to press it into the port. See, you see, I'm doing a chopping technique, but my port is pointing slightly down and it's embedded in the nucleus. So no way the iris can press it into the uh, port. So that is a very important trick you learn in case of floppy iris. And use a slow motion FACO. You don't have to really rush and do these things. And keep filling up the uh, uh, anterior chamber with viscoelastic because that helps to keep the pupil a little bit away and gives you a good control over the, um, the whole uh, surgery. And then you can go ahead with the lens implantation. So this, um, so again, coming to hard cataracts, myotic pupil, the size of the pupil, like I told you, is very relative. It depends upon the surgeon's skill and also the iris tissue properties. The iris is very rigid. Like the first case I showed you, you can go ahead and do it without any pupil expansion. But if it is something like a floppy iris, then you're sure you're going to get into trouble. So, so depending on that, you can decide whether you want to uh, use a pupil expander or not. And also decide on uh, what is the other comorbidities a patient has, and then go ahead and use a pupil expander. So this is again a very small video showing how you can uh, do a... Um, can do the rexis under the pupillary margin, so in a small pupil, so you get a slightly larger rexis than the pupillary size, and that avoids any uh, problems related to uh, the uh, small rexis. So you can see it's just right under the pupillary margin. So it gives us very good access to the nuclear material without any uh, uh, stress on the uh, zonules. So most important, uh, important features are anterior capsular staining, good hydrodissection, you might have to do multiple quadrant hydrodissection. Nucleus management can be a vertical chop or you use cold FACO that is hyperpulse or ellipse or ozil in these patients. So the intrinsic challenges are poor visibility, fibrotic or fragile anterior capsules, large lens size, adherent cortical capsular additions, deficient epinucleus, tenacious leathery fibers, and a thin posterior capsule. So in spite of all these challenges with small pupil and heart cataract, it can be overcome by proper mental preparation by the surgeon and a few simple tricks. Thank you. So I'd like to request Dr. Ramon Rajan to come and give his talk on femto, uh, femto uh, in heart cataracts. Any questions? Uh, it's made by uh, uh, Swan Batacharji. No, no, it's uh, a... It's a real, I don't know which is which company is... Uh, Indian company only is making... Jojo, Jojo Sajika. Uh, yeah, okay, okay. Jojo Sajika. He, he sent over a batch of them, so that's why... No, Jojo Sajika. It's only 1,500 rupees. It's very useful.